John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, John. Uh, we are flying solo today for another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Um, I just made it back from Little Rock, Arkansas, where um, I was doing some uh, some gabbing with about 40 aviation mechanics, and we're going to be talking about mechanics and Charlie Taylor Day. And uh, I was also reminiscing about an accident that I was the investigator in charge of that uh, occurred back on uh, June 1st of 1999 involving an American Airlines MD-80 MD that crashed at Little Rock. And unfortunately, there were nine fatalities. And we're going to be touching on that particular accident later in the show. But I want to get to you because uh, you are in uh, Daytona Beach wearing an Embry-Riddle hat because you've been spending the day on campus chatting it up about Charlie Taylor Day and, uh, and maintenance. Well, I, the hat's an interesting story because uh, at the aerospace maintenance competition, uh, I kept badgering the Emory Riddle people for a hat. And of course, they, you know, they're not home, so they didn't have any hats to spare. So I badgered them. So when I showed up here, at Emory Riddle, I went through my collection of hats and took the worst, ugliest hat that I had, and I wore it down here. <laughs> um, and uh, I badgered them that, that I had to reach the bottom of the barrel to get a hat because they wouldn't share any. And they <laughs> they quickly ran out and got me a hat. Uh, that's awesome. Well, that, that's good. Well, I'm glad you uh, class things up for the show today. So uh, being on campus and having an opportunity to talk to students and interact with uh, with the maintenance folks, tell us about what you did briefly uh, before we get into uh, talking about American 1420. Well, there's a couple of interesting things going on down here. So I got down here in time to participate partially in a safety program that Emory Riddle is developing internally. And it's focused on GA, it's focused on their operation but it's got a number of parameters that they record and it's analyzed automatically through the part of the program. And they have about a year and a half's worth of data in the program now. And the interesting findings that they had, the exceptions, the things that happened, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed at the same time of the year, there, there was a, a similar problems. So, you know, what that means, I, we don't know yet, but it was interesting to see that there was a sort of a cycle or calendar to, to some of the events that they were seeing, the exceptions. None of them were drastically bad. I mean, we're talking about over a year, two events. So it's really focusing down very tightly. And uh, they'll well along with it. And probably within the next year, uh, they will be finished. And I plan on sharing it with the industry. So I think it's a pretty robust program. And I'm anxious to see how that comes out because we have struggled for so long trying to bring down the general aviation accident rate. So there's there's some promise here. Well, uh, with, with, that with that kind of program, I mean, when you look at Embry-Riddle's uh, flight training program, it is very structured. It is overseen, uh, you know, by the university with a lot of scrutiny. And so, yeah, you wouldn't expect to see a lot of errors. 
So the data collection, yeah, it's going to be somewhat scrubbed, not from an intentional way, but the fact that because it is such a structured program, I'm wondering if they couldn't take that out into the field and find some small to medium-sized independent flight schools that could then collect that same data and forward it to Embry-Riddle as a contrast, a compare and contrast to identify those real issues. Because again, Embry-Riddle pilots, uh, the students coming out of there um, are already in a very structured program and they're just going to build on that as they continue their professional career where we're seeing these accident rates, especially with flight instructors and flight instruction are these independent schools. And that's the target for finding out what's going on, finding out the attitudes, why there are mistakes, why we're having these incidents and accidents and trying to develop solutions with that data. You know, that one, those all were discussion points at this meeting. And uh, it's their intent to move it out when they feel like it's mature enough. I, I actually thought it might be mature enough already, but they, you know, they they want to have it uh, much more refined before they put it out into the world. So, but I'm encouraged. And to get to your point about being so controlled, uh, they they fly primarily two uh, airplane types, and they've developed their own rather extensive pre-flight check that the students have to go through. And I, I'll tell you what, I'm very, very impressed about the pre-flight. You know me, I've been preaching pre <laughs> yep. uh, endlessly until I'm, I'm running out of breath. But uh, I'm going to leave here with copies of their pre-flight. Good. And, and we'll, we'll have a session just talking about that, on what they look at and why. So it's... Uh, I mean, they've really done some good work in the last few years. I mean, you and I were down here two and a half years ago, and uh, they've moved the ball internally quite a bit since then. So that's great to hear, and uh, I uh, I hope that uh, you know the information that does come out will uh, will be positively received um, in the industry because it it is critical. Let's touch on maintenance real quick down there. Uh, what was going on with the maintenance guys? At, well, you know, at Charlie students. Taylor's day today, we had a, a large group of people that came at, at lunchtime, and I got to present to them uh, and talking about careers for maintenance. Uh, but there was a large group of student pilots as well, and we had some airline representatives there. So it was a it was a big, well attended event, and it was a good time. Aside from the free lunch, the, you know, <laughs> the free lunch for students, you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all the students showed up that's a good way to guarantee that i was going to have a good turnout for my presentation <laughs> whether they awesome. wanted to know about maintenance or not they were coming huh <laughs> that's right gotta get that free lunch well, uh, but that was good. good and they have an interesting maintenance program down here and they they take you know it's very controlled now is it too sanitary for the real world i bet there'll be some people that think it is and and, and there may be some of these individuals, both maintenance and, uh, and, and pilots, that have little hiccups when they're trying to transition. But one of the things that I was also very pleased and, and proud as hell for them, uh, Emery Riddle's all-female team won the aerospace maintenance competition for, for schools. Number That's one, awesome. It's, it was awesome. And uh, those kids are really awesome. Well, I, I love the energy. I wish I said, I wish I had half of what they have. Well, good. Maybe what you need to do is put the message out while you're down there and we'll get the team on the show. And let's talk to them about what their motivations are, why they chose to go to, uh, and I call it the dark side, since they're always working basically under the wing of an airplane in a hangar versus uh, the sunshine, you know, front end of a, the pointy end of an airplane. So we should get them on the show. And um, and just talk to them and see what motivated them and why they chose that uh, that field versus you know the more glamorous side of aviation. So, and the, the, uh, two of them have already got jobs with United. One in one in Dallas and one in uh, Houston. United was right down there to pick the best of the best. You know, and that's what they that's what they've been doing. We, you know, we don't have we the, at the competition don't have a good way to track. Uh, what happens to the students after the 
competition at Nova. But we do know this year that we've had over 50 of them hired. That's right? awesome. so the, the total number we don't know, but just the opportunity that the competition uh, allows them. And the skills, abilities, and knowledge that they bring is recognized. The United Airlines requires all their new hires to go through, before they get hired, uh, a qualification test where they have to go through a number of maintenance steps. I went through it myself not long ago, and it's a, it can be challenging. And uh, they waived that for any of the any of the students that uh, participated in the competition, wow. because the competition is tough enough that, that they can demonstrate and see just by observing them. And they are there observing them. All the airlines are there looking at these students and what the way they perform. And uh, you know, Southwest American. I know they all, even Delta, who didn't feel the team. Uh, they, they were there picking students off. Uh, offering them jobs based upon their their performance at the competition, so I'm proud of that that uh, we were able to provide that vehicle for these students to get some decent jobs. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. So, how long are you going to be down? Another day? Uh, Not, another talking? day down here. So tomorrow morning, I have some work over in the hangar to do. But so you know, I love walking around hangars. So it's like being home. And. Uh, so I'll be hanging out in the hangar tomorrow. And my flight's in the afternoon. Well, good. Well, I look forward to us both going back down there like we did before, talking to some of the students. And uh, maybe we can even track down Tony, who was uh, a freshman when we uh, when we interviewed him for our show when you and I were down there. Now he's a senior. Uh, he's just gotten his uh, certified flight instructor certificate. I had uh, the opportunity to to see him when he came home briefly and uh, we had a great chat and i think that uh, the listeners especially those who ha are are young and want to go into the field of aviation especially on the pilot side are considering embry riddle or any other flight school you hear it direct from a student who started as a freshman the toils the troubles and how he's progressed now uh, into his senior year may be beneficial not only to students or potential students but also to uh, to parents because they'll hear it from a kid who has really excelled down there. Um, he wants to stay another year uh, to work on his master's. That's how he's com how much he's committed to it, rather than immediately jump ship and go fly for the airlines. He wants to uh, to get a master's in safety. So um, it may be uh, an interesting conversation. So we'll have to get Tony on the show. So yes, I think it would. Yeah. So switching gears, like I said, I was in Little Rock. And of course, that brought back memories uh, flying in there because uh, the weather this time of year, you know, thunderstorms build up, bumpy going in there. And I started thinking about uh, June 1st of 1999 when I launched with a team from the NTSB to go investigate American Airlines Flight 1420 that had crashed uh, the night of June 1st. Um, at Little Rock International Airport. It's now called Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, Airport. But um, that airplane, unfortunately, there were nine fatalities, including the captain, who uh, was not only a senior pilot, but he was the chief pilot for American Airlines Chicago base. And um, in getting down here and, and looking at all the, the issues that were developed, and we've done a show previously uh, about American 1420, where you and I, and I think Todd, we all dissected that report. But I think it's uh, just a good reminder and a good refresher um, that there were some good um, issues that were developed and identified with potential for corrective action. Of course, you know, this was a, a flight crew centric accident. Um, it started early in the morning in Chicago. They ended up in Salt Lake City. And of course, being that time of year, there were thunderstorms, delays. Uh, they were late getting out of Salt Lake. And then they got to DFW and thunderstorm activity. They were delayed down there. They didn't have an airplane in position. They had to switch airplanes to try and finish off the last leg of the flight. And uh, they were hurried by not only the weather, but um, they were given a briefing 
through dispatch that uh, because of the thunderstorm activity building up and the thunderstorms were building up in isolation, but there was a potential for them to merge that they really needed to get in the air and what they call get, get through the bowling alley because there were two thunderstorms that were building up and would merge. And so there was an alleyway that if these guys had gotten off at a particular time, they could make it through before, uh, before those thunderstorms those thunderstorms merged and closed the uh, the door behind them. So uh, they got everybody on board and they were running late and they were pushing up against their 14 hour duty day. And all of these things then started to cascade into a series of events that put this crew in a position of jeopardy. And, you know, we talk about it all the time, John. And one of the things, of course, is self-induced pressure. And this is one of those classic cases where you have a captain who, uh, as we found in the uh, the accident investigation, had been awake for 16 hours. Now, people don't ask, eh, 16 hours, so what? Well, 16 hours, when you start looking at it from the aspects that we've all examined in aviation regarding fatigue and decision making, um, we've done a number of studies, and this, this report uh, was no different. The studies have found that uh, at about the 13 hour wakefulness period is when the human starts making mistakes in their thinking. And now you look at this captain and you look at some of the decisions that were made um, during the course of this flight, especially the, the latter part of this flight, you can start to see how fatigue has influenced some bad decision making. And it's not just pilots because, you know, it can happen to mechanics as well, because you've talked about the fact that you guys have worked multiple shifts, long days, even in some cases, 24 hour shifts, trying to get airplanes in and out of a hangar. Yes, it's very common for maintenance people to work uh, more than 16 hours a day. The FAA sort of frowns on it, and they've come down on a number of companies to, to uh, address that but it's not universally applied across the industry yet. You know, so the airlines that I work for, we had some individuals that work for some very long days routinely and, and the FAA really finally clamped down on them. But it's, there's a lot of areas that, you know, small FBOs and uh, repair stations where that doesn't happen. So it, it is an issue and we need to, to uh, sharpen our pencil on that with the FAA and, and uh, get focused because it does, it crosses everybody, dispatches everybody, you know, especially after COVID with, uh, with all of the uh, manpower shortages that we have because of uh, so many people retired and it's so hard to get employees today. I mean, every, I, every single maintenance organization that I talk to is got openings and they can't fill them. They've had them for a while. They've advertised, they've known that they're just, there's no bodies out there. And of course the, the pilot shortage is getting all the press about yeah. all, the, all the pilots and, and the regional airline association is canceling flights pretty regularly because of lack of pilots. And uh, United just uh, pulled out of uh, Westchester County, White Plains, New York. And one of the reasons they said was that uh, the difficulty scheduling because of the pilot shortage. You know, and, and you bring up a good point because that shortage does cut across the board, uh, even into air traffic control. The FAA has got issues trying to find uh, inspectors to work in their, um, their flight standard district offices that, uh, and they are the ones that are responsible for the oversight, both from the operations, maintenance and avionics standpoint, they're having difficulties. And so, you know, we identified some of those kinds of issues in American 1420 with some of the oversight. It wasn't due to the shortage, but, um, you know, this is going to continue to be a problem. I think it's, uh, it's going to be a problem with not only flight schools, especially 141 flight schools, the ones that are certified by the FAA. But again, you have a, a manpower shortage for the oversight of these regional carriers. And guess what? Guess where all of these younger new pilots are, are starting their career in the regional. So uh, that's a concern. But when we look at American 1420, 
one of the other things that uh, we found amongst others with bad decision making was you and I talked about this off air and that was they were rushed because they were trying to get to uh, to Little Rock. They did have enough gas. They had enough gas to even go back to Dallas. So it wasn't a matter that they were going to run fuel critical. They could have even held for 30 minutes, let the thunderstorm pass, let the weather calm down. But uh, they chose to uh, to try and get into Little Rock and they were scheduled to land on a different runway. But as they approached the airport, they were getting wind information from the air traffic controller, who I call it hinting and hoping. He kept giving them not only wind reports, but wind shear alerts. And I think without telling them directly, he was hinting, look, the weather stinks down here. The wind is all over the place. We got wind shear. Go away. Go do something else. But uh, these guys were hell bent on landing at Little Rock. They ended up altering their course to land on runway four, which terminates basically at the Arkansas River. So the runway is elevated. It then goes uh, down a slope of about 30 to 40 feet. And then the Arkansas River is right there. And while at the time they, they were flying, that didn't really matter other than the fact they were landing on runway four. What came to be was that uh, because they were rushed, they didn't perform um, the approach checklist or at least the, the, the in route, or excuse me, the descent checklist and get the airplane configured properly. They never set the automated braking system and they never got the ground spoilers armed. Those are two critical elements, especially when you're landing on a wet runway. Yes. And, and you know, and don't forget there's one other piece. Every minute that they were still in the air, was a minute that the flight was delayed the next morning because they didn't have the minimum required rest period at night. So not only were they going to bring their passengers in late at night, they were going to delay the passengers the next morning. And most of us that travel know that you don't want to be late on a departure because you're, more, you're going to miss your connections, right? So you're getting into, if you're going back to Dallas, when they get into Dallas, you have 35, 40, 45 minutes to make connections, right? These guys were already going to be that late. So that meant all those connections in, in uh, Dallas were going to be missed. And you don't want to be missing connections because sometimes there's no seats on the next flight or the next two flights. I mean, not, not long ago, I missed my connection in Miami and I ended up having to stay there the entire day because I couldn't get out. Well, you bring up you bring up a good point as well, and that is because this was a management pilot, the captain was a management pilot. He's processing all of the other th all of the other expenses and the cost of uh, of going to an alternate, not necessarily just sitting in the air and burning gas for thirty minutes, but you know their alternate was Memphis. So now, um, if you go to your alternate, now you got to bus all these people across back to Little Rock and a variety of other expenses and then move the airplane. And so we had this debate um, during the course of the investigation of whether or not money or at least parts of the bottom line had an influence on decision making to go to destination, original destination versus an alternate destination. And these are the kinds of little things, the backstories, the, the, the issues that we we toy with and we tr uh, toil with as investigators about whether or not that possibly had in any any influence on decision making. Yeah, it's hard not to have an, that influence to decision making. Once you put those thoughts in your mind, you can't get rid of them. Yeah. So it definitely has a, has a role to play in your performance. One of the studies that uh, we utilized, of course, was the MIT study where they looked at 2,000 operations or almost 2,000 operations during the summertime going into and out of uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport during thunderstorm periods. And the interesting conclusion that came out of it is that almost 1,400 of those 2,000 flights where pilots had to make a decision whether or not they're going to continue through a line of thunderstorms to get into the airport, almost three quarters of those, almost 67%, um, actually ventured into the thunderstorm 
to try and go to destination versus uh, making the decision to abandon going into the airport and either going to an alternate or taking some type of alternate corrective action. And that was a real interesting study because it helped us understand why these guys would try to get into Little Rock when they knew there was a thunderstorm. And the bottom line of that study was that typically if pilots were within 25 or 30 nautical miles of the terminal area, they chose to try and penetrate that weather just because they were so close. It's right there. We're almost there. We can find our way through the weather and get in. And it was an interesting behavioral study that really shaped the way we wrote this report. Yeah, it's, you know, human beings, sometimes we think we can take the human being out of the cockpit, we're going to improve the accident rate. But when, and that's right, they probably would, but we're not there yet. We don't have the automated systems, we don't have the information. And, uh, you know, you have said it repeatedly, among others, that the the automated AI, if you will, automatic uh, artificial intelligence, uh, wouldn't have helped Sullenberg's airplane. You know, he digested all that information quickly and made the decision, proper decision, to put that airplane down because he wasn't going to make it anywhere else. And anywhere else in, in the river was probably going to result in a lot of people being dead, both on the airplane and on the ground. Yeah. So he, he did it, and he did it well. So nobody nobody died in uh, in the water landing, which is unusual. So it was a tribute to his flying ability. Uh, Navy flying probably did a, did a lot for him. But in any event, uh, the artificial intelligence, some people want to put in airplanes today to replace the pilots. We don't have it yet. No. I think we will eventually, but I, we don't have it yet. Look, the human is the most flexible and adaptable machine in the front end of an airplane, so much better than a computer, because we can digest real-time instantaneous information a computer can't see out the window and and even through artificial intelligence artificial intelligence would only have a very limited view in the front end of uh, of an airplane so yeah there is there are a lot of pitfalls and that's why yes even if we have mistakes by the human in the front end of an airplane doesn't mean that we, they need to be replaced by a machine that uh, all they do is, you know, digest ones and zeros, if you will. A couple of, a couple of other things that, uh, that came to light in this particular accident was uh, the fact that when, uh, when the captain did get the airplane on the ground, it, unfortunately, they had exceeded their crosswind limitation. Um, the crosswind limitation for this particular airplane under American Airlines on a wet runway was 10 knots. And the wind was significantly greater, was up around 25. And so that was a mistake. Then, of course, because the uh, ground spoilers did not deploy once the airplane settled on the ground, um, there was a lack of communication about confirmation of whether or not those spoilers deployed. And, um, and they weren't. And nobody ever went back. The first officer never went in to confirm that they had deployed. And then the last part of this is when the captain had the airplane on the ground and they started hydroplaning. Um, they were zooming down this short runway. It's only about 8,000 feet. Um, he was pulling on the thrust reverser and the max thrust reverser at that time, or at least according to procedure, was 1.3. He got the EPR up into about 1.6 and I think at one point even 1.7. Because of the disrupted airflow, caused by those tail mounted engines and the thrust reversers, it blanks the, uh, the good air over the rudder. And so now they lost uh, lateral control of the airplane. And, and that's critical when you're navigating on the runway because you're using the rudder uh, while it's still effective for lateral guidance to, to stay on the runway. And, um, and unfortunately, he didn't have that. And you can tell that by the track on the runway where the airplane started to swerve and eventually got sideways going off the end of the runway. And I know, John, that, you know, we talk about it's these little things. It is the sequence of events. It's these cascading little failures that culminate into a catastrophic event. So, and, and I, you know, I want to 
point out that all these little events that we're talking about today oftentimes don't find their way into NTSB reports. You know, we've we've just recently examined the report and there was actually findings stated in the, the, the report that weren't backed up by any facts within the report. So there's, there's some disconnects going on inside the NTSB uh, over the last few years and maybe it's COVID related. I don't know what the cause is, but it is a little bit disheartening to see uh, some of the quality or lack of quality coming out of the NTSB for the reports. And I'm hoping now that they, they have a number of openings. I hope that they get them filled and get back to do the good work that we all expect of them. Uh, because these little nuances, you know, you we get enough of the big events that cause the accident, but there's so much that can be mined for accident investigation from all these little pieces you put them together. And that's just what Emory Riddle is doing with their this program and they're putting together for GA. It's bringing together all these little nuances uh, that happen in an operation to start to pinpoint where the problems are. Yeah. And yeah. We, used, we used to do a very good job of that at the NTSB. And uh, we've slipped some recently and, and let's hope we get back on track. Yeah, well, wrapping up this particular accident, a couple learning lessons, and then um, uh, one of them was that uh, a lot of uh, pilots at the time, based on some of the information we were able to garner, um, they thought that uh, the use of thrust reverse um, was a very effective braking tool, if you will, that it contributed a lot to the actual total braking once the airplane was on the ground and decelerating. And in fact, it really isn't. Tail-mounted airplane engines, um, such as on this MD-80 and uh, and now the 717, which is more prevalent in service. And then, of course, we've got a lot of business just with tail-mounted uh, engines with thrust reversers. Uh, we looked at it and found that only about 5% of thrust reverse contributes to the total braking action of the airplane, and that it is the wheel brakes that are the predominant decelerator of an aircraft. And if you get into a hydroplane situation, now you've lost all that braking. So uh, we did a very extensive discussion of that in this particular report. And then finally, um, you know, with the recommendations that came out, uh, American Airlines used the silent checklist where the non-flying pilot would run the checklist and uh, basically flip a series of light switches on a um, on a mechanical checklist that was mounted on the pedestal. And then once all those elements were completed, that's the only call that would be <laughs> made verbally is checklist complete. There was no system of checks and balances. And we, the board made a recommendation that they do away with that because the captain wasn't plugged into this. And then there's a lot of assumptions built in that if a, a, a pilot says checklist complete, it's assumed that all the elements were completed when in fact we know that the ground spoilers weren't armed and the uh, auto brakes were not uh, turned to the appropriate setting. Yeah, and, that's, and that spoiler, I mean, it's so important to get those wheels planted on the ground because the, the, the airplane is going fast enough that that wing is still going to provide some lift Maybe not enough to take it off, but make it light on its on its gear, and that's you know a recipe for hydro planning right there. Yeah. So um, again, because it's the anniversary, um, and uh, just flying into Little Rock, the funny thing is, I got off the airplane, and that terminal hasn't changed since I left it in 1999. John, <laughs> it was like stepping back into a time machine. Yeah, they've made some upgrades and that kind of stuff, but it was still the same terminal. Um, but uh, uh, I know a lot of people at the uh, at the airport in the FBO business, and it was good to see them. And, um, you know, they, uh, they made some strides with the airport based on the accident and our recommendations. I think they even put in uh, an EMAS system, which is that uh, frangible or breakable concrete at the end of the runway for the event of an overrun. And that was one of the things that we had talked about as part of the uh, American 1420 accident. So, so with that, my friend, 
Um, I will leave you since Todd isn't here. We don't have second to the last words. I'm going to leave you with our last words. And as usual, I'm going to just ask everybody, please, if you're going to go flying, do a good pre-planning session before you even get to the airport. Do it again when you get to the airport with the latest information. When you get out to your airplane, do a thorough walk around. We're going to go through those Emory Riddle checklists and uh, just talk about those at a future show. Uh, good checklists can save a lot of problems, save a lot of money, never mind saving your... your, <laughs> saving your yeah. Yeah, you, you get that one. Uh, yes, I did. I am an investigator. And, and when you get in the air, put that head on a swivel because we have so many new people out there flying in and around airports. And, uh, you know, mid airs and near mid airs occur way too frequently. And those are 100% avoidable. Just got to keep your head up instead of buried down on the instrument panel. So please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.